I rise to render my support for the bill that is before us, shortly entitled the Appropriation Bill 2018. The Appropriation 2018 Bill 2017. And at the same time, while I'm on my feet, to go over for the benefit of this parliament and the people of this country, our taxpayers, what the plans are for the Ministry of Health, Social Services, Community Development and Gender Affairs in terms of the budgetary allocations that we have been given to operate these ministries on behalf of the people of this country. With your leave, Madam Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I will start with the Ministry of Health which, as noted yesterday by the Honorable Mover of the Bill, has been allocated the sum of 57,109,894, which represents a 3.5% increase over the 2017 allocation. Now, as I make my presentation, I would like to put in context, as it relates to the Ministry of Health, that the Ministry is divided into two sections in terms of how the work of health care is carried out in the Federation. The first part being the institution-based health services, which refers to our hospitals, JNF, Mary Charles, Pogson. And of course, in Nevis, there is Alexandra, the sister institution. And the other part of the ministry refers to the community-based health services. And these are the services that are located throughout the length and breadth of the island, and by extension, the federation, practiced largely through the 17 health centers that form that nexus of community-based services. And of course, of that 17, 11 of those health centers are located here in St. Kitts. And of course, these centers offer DMO clinics, as well as antenatal and postnatal clinics, dental health um, units which provide care for such individuals requiring such services, and of course special clinics that address the specific needs of children, persons who are diabetic, hypertensive, etc. Now what is the situation analysis as it relates to the Ministry of Health? From our vantage point, the Ministry of Health has been on an upward path towards recovery based on the state in which we found the Ministry upon taking office in February of 2015. In such a short space of time, there has been a remarkable improvement in terms of the addition and renovation of infrastructure in particular. And I point to examples such as the rebuilding of the Mary Charles Hospital in Molyneux, the construction of the Mental Health Day Treatment Center, which was for the most part a salvage mission, considering that the CDB allotment for that project had run its course before construction could have been completed, going back several years. But nevertheless, the government saw the importance of that investment and would have put in over 800,000 of its own money to top up the portion that was left available to us by the CDB through the Basic Needs Trust Fund. And of course, the other facility being the establishment of the oncology unit at the back of the Joseph and France General Hospital. So in just 22 short months, we were able to accomplish that. But nevertheless, the work of the transformation in the Ministry of Health continues apace. And to the point now where we have ventured more publicly and more concertedly into the issue of healthcare financing from the standpoint of public-private participation and partnership, the PPP model. And in particular, just as of the 5th of October, we would have opened to the public our very own CT scan machine, jointly owned by a local investor, to the tune of some $500,000. And this is not a tiny investment, but was made deliberately because of the challenges that the country continues to face with non-communicable diseases. And in that context, most of the requests for the CT scan would be for those types of diagnostic services to ascertain matters such as stroke patients, formation of blood clots, aneurysms, etc., so that prompt medical and corrective life-saving interventions can be made to benefit the patients concerned. Of course, we also had, previous to that, the private sector invest investment in an MRI operation, which has helped our delivery of health care in that we no longer have to send... We no longer have to send persons overseas to secure those types of diagnostic tests in the interest of time. 
and so that we can get to persons. Okay. If I may continue, um, Deputy Speaker, from where we sit in the Ministry of Health, there is still a lot of ground that we need to cover. And of course, a lot of our challenges are issues relating to human resources, attitudes to employment, shortages as it relates to specialist skills, matters to do with work ethic, matters such as absenteeism, lateness, issues of that nature, which in an emergency-driven industry would not be acceptable because we require persons to be on the job, present and accounted for, so that care is rendered to the persons who need it in a timely, professional and accurate manner. The Ministry, by extension, and this was noted by the Honourable Mover of the Bill yesterday, continues to be part of the EU pilot project that seeks to bring about transformation in the public sector by way of the tying of productivity and performance and pay systems in the way remuneration should be taking place in a modern economy. And the two other ministries that partner with the Ministry of Health are the Ministry of Education and the Ministry responsible for public infrastructure. Now, in my 2016 budget intervention, I would have also indicated that similar provisions have been made internally by the Ministry to include in that process the Ministry of Social Services, Gender Affairs and Community Development so that we can be ahead of the game as it relates to the measurement of productivity, performance and pay system so that gradually St. Kitts and Nevis can move away from the European colonial and archaic model of an entitlement system that has been based by just increments that may or may not necessarily be tied to performance. So that there will be clearer indicators in terms of what the benchmarks are, what are the standards, and that performance and productivity are tied to individual job descriptions that compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges. And when I say this, I'm also uh, bearing in mind that a number of first world countries have gone that route, a number of them that we can take example from, for example, Singapore, which comes out on top year after year in terms of the world doing business ratings as put out by the World Bank. So there are best practices for us to draw from, and that is precisely what we are endeavoring to do. While I'm on that subject in terms of the human resource-based reform project within the Ministry of Health, I should also point to the fact that because of our relationship with PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, the Ministry of Health is having the benefit of an advantage over the other two ministries which are part of the EU project in terms of the grant funding that has been made available to the ministry for a project entitled these past few years as Human Resources for Health for meant to achieve similar objectives as those I would have indicated earlier. So we are looking forward to that addition as we build out the productivity and output with regards to the staff of the Ministry of Health and where gaps exist that we can address them as far as we are able. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, as we look towards our regional economies and the state of play that is afoot at the moment, we are recognizing more and more that the competitive advantage of our Caribbean member states, especially small states like ours, depend in large measure on our ability to compete based on our human resource base. In other words, nearly every single territory in this region has or may be considering a CBI program, which has been ongoing for years. All of us have the same sand, sea, and sun in terms of tourism. And we have all of the other natural attributes that every other Caribbean member state can point to as an advantage for them. However, if we are going to make a meaningful difference, it is the considered opinion of the management of the Ministry of Health and by extension the Cabinet that the only frontier left for us to compete on as a nation, as a sub-region, as a CARICOM basin would be on the area of our human resource base. And that it is for that reason why commendations are in order relative to the decision taken to 
put as a theme for this year's budget process, putting people first in the pursuit of sustainable development. And of course, that is a takeoff from the sustainable development goals that would have been agreed to by all of the UN member states several years ago with the actual actualization of those 17 goals by the year 2030. And of course, a number of those goals are relative to health performance indicators, environmental considerations, etc. with the crux of all of them having been the partnership for the goals, as did their precursor, the Millennium Development Goals had several years before that. Now, especially when we take into consideration the fact that St. Kitts and Nevis has a population that is still under 50,000, with a, with a subpopulation of under 30,000 that constitute the labor force, it tells us that we need to pay particular attention to matters to do with productivity, performance, and competitiveness. And it is not something we have the luxury of uh, being lackadaisical on or to procrastinate on because it is a matter that is going to determine whether we get left behind or whether we are able to keep up with the rest of the developing world because in our context, smallness is not an excuse and not a reason for you to operate in the land of mediocrity. Everybody has the same bite at the cherry regardless of your size, your population, your tax base, etc. Now, as I move on to some of the issues confronting the Ministry of Health, I should point out that the issue of crime continues to be one that continues to impact on the healthcare infrastructure of the Federation. And during the period January to October of 2017, the JNF Hospital would have recorded some 18 cases of gunshot wounds, with all 18 of them requiring surgical intervention. We have also recorded 18 cases of stab wounds during the same period for 2017, with again, all 18 of them requiring surgical intervention. While it might be true that these figures represent a 35% reduction in gun-related injuries that have to be addressed at our state medical institutions, it also shows an increase by 80% in terms of stab wounds, which is telling us that we do have a lot of work to do in terms of our people being able to manage emotions, uh, operate in a mature, intelligent manner, and practice more tolerance. So while we commend the fact that there has been a reduction in the rate of crime, and by extension, low levels of stress on the healthcare infrastructure, we still need to ensure that we keep these matters in check, considering that they bring undue burden on the medical staff, surgery, etc., the ICU, emergency medical technicians, accident and emergency departments. And when you combine that with issues to do with lapses in work ethic, where persons have to now double up for others who are not present, it means that it places even more strain on those emergency medical personnel to get certain things done in the interest of time to save lives and provide quality care to individuals who are in need of such care. The Ministry, if I can go on, Madam Deputy Speaker, also has in front of us a number of other challenges, the chief one being the issue of non-communicable diseases. It's a very high incidence and the cost to the public purse is tremendous. In his remarks yesterday, the move of the bill would have noted quite accurately that 83% of the deaths in the Federation are related to complications of non-communicable diseases. And for the benefit of the public, we are referring to issues such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, diabetes, and hypertension. So these are some very troubling issues that continue to plague us in addition to the HR matters that we have in front of us. We also have matters to do with the stress that healthcare workers carry with them and carry home with them. Because it's only when you spend time in an emergency department and see some of the emergency care that is rendered in response to some of the horrendous issue instances of crime, it is then you would realize that unless you have a very strong constitution and uh, you are basically unemotional about the things that happen around you, you will most, more than likely take home these issues with you, which is not good. 
but then it comes out of care and concern for the persons who we are charged to look after. So that too is an issue for us. The issue of short staffing continues to confront us, especially as it relates to specialized nursing care and to some extent community-based nursing care. And of course, because of that particular issue, we would want to spend particular time and investment on that matter so that we can put more, in, more infrastructure and more resources in place to address the issues of NCDs at the community level. But I will get to that a little further down in my presentation. On the matter with the inability to recruit local nurses who are trained in specialized skill sets, some of these areas include hemodialysis, the management and administration as it relates to the ICU, the emergency medical management that takes place in the a &E department, and of course the oncology department, which is the unit geared towards the treatment of cancer via chemotherapy-based interventions. We also have a problem that, has be, uh, that is growing. It is not just a problem for the Ministry of Health. It is becoming a problem for the Ministry of Education, a sister partner ministry to, to health. And that has to do with the number of nurses in the Federation, well, I should refer to them as graduate nurses, whether they come from universities out of Cuba or they graduate from the Clarence Fitzroy Bryan College. We are seeing an increasing trend where all three attempts at the regional examination of nurse registration are being failed. And when that happens, we face a very real situation that could become litigious for us, for the hospital, for the ministry, for the government, in that according to the law, based on what is enshrined in the act that speaks to the Nurses and Midwives Council, if you're not registered, you are not a nurse. And in order to have uh, that situation public fixed, public there must be that individual being able to pass the exam so that they can then move on. So that is a matter for us right now. It's a matter now for the Human Resource Department in terms of what do we do with these individuals? Because something must be done about them in terms of perhaps maybe offering them some other type of alternative employment. There is also the matter of the continued build out of the GWAN, the government wide area network, so that we can bring online all of our institution based and community based health services so that we can have speedier access to care driven by an ID card which is being done courtesy for us through the Republic of China on Taiwan as it relates to the data for each registered person being on that card, which then becomes immediately available to the various health centers and hospitals should that individual have to present themselves there for care. So that the tedium that would normally be associated with registering for assistance, filling out forms, all of that will be a thing of the past. And by extension, the monitoring and evaluation that needs to take place as it relates to productivity and performance insofar as the biometric clock system would be concerned for education and also for health, that would be facilitated via that infrastructure, which my colleague, the Attorney General, has assured us will be done within the next few months, or at least completed, so that is a matter that we look forward to. We are also seeing in St. Kitts and Nevis sustained levels of HIV infection, particularly among older females who are past childbearing age. And that is a matter that has now become central for us in terms of public education, where it might be taken for granted that you can no longer get pregnant and that you can throw caution to the wind. That is not an option. Because just because a woman has passed childbearing age doesn't mean that you're immune to becoming affected or infected by HIV. Uh, but I will come to those figures later on. And of course, the other challenge, if I could just name one more, is the absence of backup coverage at the hospital as it relates to radiology and ophthalmology. We only had, up until this year's estimate period, one person each in that post, which means that if that person is sick or on vacation, we do have a problem. And it may mean having to recruit an individual from the private sector to fill that void until that substantive office holder returns to the job. 
Now, what have we done in response to some of the challenges in terms of the human resource issues? We have completed virtually all of the job descriptions for the staff within the Ministry of Health in preparation for that new process of performance appraisals, paper for, for performance, as well as productivity improvements and enhancements. We have also had to do out of necessity recruit the services of uh, some nurses outside of St. Kitts and Nevis to handle areas such as the ICU, the surgical theater, the maternity and neonatal wing of JNF, the emergency room, and also hemodialysis. At the present time, there are some 21 foreign nurses that we have in our system, with 16 of them being from the Philippines, five from Cuba, and of course, we have some others from some of the other member states within the CARICOM region. What we would like to see is for more of our nurses to avail themselves of the specialized training opportunities so that we can eliminate the need to recruit labor from overseas to fill these voids. The Wi-Fi for the entire JNF hospital that is virtually built out in terms of improving communication access to diagnostic tests, et cetera, throughout the facility so that care can be rendered in a faster manner to patients who are either on the compound for outpatient procedures or inpatients having been hospitalized on any one of the wards. Public education in terms of safe sex practices, that is an ongoing process for the health information unit and the health promotion unit within the Ministry of Health. So we are glad for that ongoing effort so that we can do some reversals in terms of the statistics that we do have on our books as it relates to sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. Now, in response to some of the short staffing, one of the, uh, one of the measures being adopted in this year's budget is that of the recruitment of an additional six staff nurses at a tune of some $343,000. We have also gotten approved for the very first time the additional ophthalmologist and the radiologist to assist us in this matter of the backup coverage that is required for those two areas, those two critical areas. And of course, th those two additions are costing $176,426. Some good news to report to the country and to the parliament by extension. One, there have been no confirmed cases of any vector-borne diseases such as Zika, chikungunya, leptospirosis, or dengue in the Federation for 2017. So we are very grateful for that, knowing that these um, illnesses continue to pose problems for some of our CARICOM member states. So we are very grateful that we have no reported cases of such. And while I'm on my feet, I should just like to document for the record the gratitude of the Ministry of Health towards the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CAFA, in terms of the assistance that continues to be rendered to us as it relates to getting these testing done in a timely manner, using our regional carriers, et cetera, so that we can ascertain the level of um, infection that might be attributed to vector-borne illnesses. The other area that we have good news to celebrate on, and that the move of the bill did yesterday, and that was to reaffirm the validation by St. Kitts and Nevis of having eliminated mother-to-child transmission of HIV and syphilis, along with five other CARICOM, member uh, CARICOM countries who have been so recognized. We are now concerned with the maintenance of that validation because it now means that every two years, St. Kitts and Nevis must be able to cut the mustard in terms of maintaining the level of validation because it can be lost if we begin having cases again in these um, particular areas. What we are already benchmarking against now is the matter to do with the EMCT Plus, which is the Elimination of Mother to Child Transmission Plus program that was recently announced by PAHO. And that is the new goal towards the elimination of hepatitis B and Chagas disease. So that is the new frontier for the Ministry of Health coming up in the next year or two. Now that we have passed the hurdle of the elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV and syphilis. If I could now turn to the matter of our health indicators and vital stats for St. Kitts and Nevis, 
And I should put a caveat here that the data that I'm about to present covers the period January to September of 2017 based on population figures of 48,614 in total, of which 12,646 persons are documented as living on Nevis and the other 35,968 living in St. Kitts. Our life expectancy rate continues to be for males 68, females 74, for an average of around 71. And of course, this is a remarkable change that we have made in terms of the advances of public health over the last 50 years or more, because based on the statistics that go back to the year 1950, life expectancy at that time was pegged at just 50 years old, which in our context these days is still considered very young. Total births for the period was 453, total live births 451, with Nevis recording 64 of those births and St. Kitts recording 389, of which 387 were live births. These figures indicate that there is a 29% drop in the birth rate since 2016, and uh, I should document that among these figures, there were multiple births in at least five instances. In other words, there were twin births, five sets of twins born throughout the Federation during that period. NCDs, in terms of our health indicators, I, as I stated earlier, 83% of all deaths in the Federation are attributed to that. And if I could get into some specifics as it relates to the NCDs, cancer, we have seen some 80 cases in St. Kitts, of which 42 of them are cases involving females. The leading cancer in St. Kitts remains breast cancer, according to some 20 cases that we have documented in 2017. There were also 29 cases of cancer in Nevis, with some 21 of them being attributed to prostate cancer. In other words, then, the leading cause of cancer in St. Kitts is breast cancer in women. The leading cause of cancer in Nevis is prostate cancer, obviously, for men. We have seen other cancers present themselves with various percentages, and if I could go through some of them, cervical cancer, which is trending downward, that's at 0.5% of the cases. The prostate, as we know, is high, so that's 27.5, and colon cancer, 12.5%. And we did see some isolated cases that were mainly one-off, but still cause for concern and monitoring. In a number of areas, for example, we have seen some cases for cancer of the penis, lymph nodes, and sweat glands. These are not very common, but we have begun to see demonstrations of that among our local population. So it is something that we have to continue monitoring very closely. And in terms of that statistic as it relates to Nevis having the highest instance of prostate cancer, by extension, 95% of the prostate cancer cases are in Nevis. So this is a matter that we have to keep our eyes closely pegged on and uh, see what best we can do to ensure that outcomes are positive, that people seek diagnostic screening earlier rather than later, and do not take for granted the importance of an annual physical even if you do not feel well. If you feel well, you should still go. Hypertension in our health centers, the 17 health centers, we have an approximate registry of 1,315 persons. This does not mean that there are only 1,315 persons who are hypertensive in the Federation, because obviously those persons who would prefer or who can afford to be treated by their private doctor, their statistics may not necessarily be included in this figure. By extension, the health centers, the 17 health centers, record some 1,331 cases of diabetes, another one of the NCDs that challenges us. And our studies are showing us that diabetes affects up to 20% of our general population, where we have seen elevated blood glucose levels. And, uh, 
In St. Kitts for 2017, we are reflecting some 934 persons registered as diabetics who are females and 379 who are males. So again, the gender differentiation as it relates to incidence of disease is pointing more heavily in the direction of female sufferers when it comes to diabetes in the Federation. So that is a matter for which we are going to be ratcheting up our public information campaign and education campaigns and working along with our sister ministry and department, social services, gender affairs, in terms of ensuring that we do put some extra effort behind the public advocacy towards healthy diets, lifestyle, weight, etc. By extension, because of the problems that we are having with um, diabetes, we are al also seeing here that out of the total count, 480 persons who are diabetic reside on Nevis and 833 on St. Kitts. And some of the statistics coming out of the hospital in terms of the terminal results are, are more or less, I would say, debilitating results as it relates to unchecked diabetes reside in the number of amputations. And the statistic from the hospitals indicate that for 2017 at JNF alone, there were some 23 amputations as a result of diabetes complication. In other words, con conditions that may have been exacerbated by poor blood flow, as well as by chronic ulcers that then led to perhaps the setting of gangrene, which then resulted in amputations to save the life of those individuals. So compared to 15 in 2016, we have now seen 23 amputations in 2017 up to October. And uh, of course, they were, these were accounted for in 14 surgeries requiring the removal of digits, meaning either fingers or toes, or in some cases, seven of those cases, removal of the lower leg just below the knee. And of course, when things like this happen, it also brings with it a cascading set of other circumstances, because in some cases, those persons with amputations may be the primary breadwinner in their households. And a diagnosis, a curative measure like that, which results in an amputation, means that that person must be fitted with a prosthetic limb if they expect to continue an active lifestyle continue to provide for their families. In some cases, that is not the case. So it then means a change in their socioeconomic status. So of course, the spiraling effect of NCDs is something that we have to keep our eye on and practice advocacy, preventive health care wherever we can. Kidney disease, we are seeing continued improvements upward in terms of the statistics as it relates to that. At JNF, there are some 14 patients on hemodialysis. And of course, in Nevis, there are, um, there, uh, no, in 14 in total in the Federation, three on Nevis, 11 on St. Kitts. And of course, these patients are normally served at the hemodialysis unit at the Jane France Hospital. That unit has been enhanced since this government took office. We would have found, I think you could call it, three and a half machines that were working. In 2016, we procured independently through government an additional four machines, including a mobile machine that can move between wards, especially the ICU. And with the new project in place with the Republic of China on Taiwan, which is the chronic kidney disease program that was recently launched in the Federation, it should see the addition next year of an additional three hemodialysis machines for a total of 10. And this is good news for us in terms of the hemodialysis staff when we consider that each session takes about four hours. And if we are having a growing number of persons requiring hemodialysis two and three times a week, if we are not careful and those machines are not maintained properly and there's not proper redundancy or downtime in, that unit could very well be running 24 hours a day. We are also monitoring the kidney register at the health centers. These are persons who are already manifesting signs of kidney disease, but are not yet at the point to require hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, and are being treated by Eprex or Clexane as an injectable to assist their kidneys in performing the functions that have gone awry. However, 
that registry had up until several months ago up to 86 persons on that list. So it will become a very troubling situation for us if those persons would deteriorate into needing peritoneal or hemodialysis because it will then put more strain on the infrastructure that we have in place. In terms of registered deaths for 2017, there's a total of 276 thus far, and I should say that is up until the end of September, and with 73 of them being recorded in Nevis, and 203 in St. Kitts, the data is also showing us that the highest number of deaths in Nevis were recorded in St. Paul's with 43, and the highest number in St. Kitts in St. George's with 146, which is not surprising considering these are the two most densely populated parishes in the Federation. There have been no deaths of children between the ages of one to four up until September 30th. However, there were 10 infant deaths up to that period. There were nine neonatal deaths, and when we say neonatal, we're referring to deaths that occur up to four weeks after birth, and there were also nine perinatal deaths, and that refers to deaths that are classified either as stillbirths or occurring up to seven days after birth, and there was one case of maternal death. Some more good news, which you'll leave, Madam Deputy Speaker, and that is to report that in terms of our teen pregnancy rate, contrary to what I would have reported with concern at last year's budget, we are now seeing that between the ages of 12 to 19, which is the teen pregnancy gap, according to the Ministry of Health, that there were nine recorded cases in Nevis and 42 in St. Kitts. When I would have given the status last year of this particular matter, we had something like 95 teen pregnancies on record in St. Kitts alone. So by this reduction, we are now seeing that there has been a drop by 46% in terms of the teen pregnancy rate. And that is something that the Ministry of Health applauds. The Department of Gender Affairs by extension applauds that because it means then that our young women have the opportunity to continue their education without distraction. They can defer childbearing and not have their development as an individual arrested by an unplanned pregnancy. Yes, it is true there are systems and projects in place to assist them so that they will not be left behind, but then from where we sit as a ministry, it is better to wait and take these things in their proper order. So we are very grateful for that reduction by 46% in terms of the teen pregnancy rate in St. Kitts. By extension, the teen pregnancies that I would have referred to also would have represented 22% of the admissions to the maternity ward at JNF. If I may move on to HIV and AIDS, up until September of 2017, we recorded eight new cases of HIV, six females, two males. In recent years, our annual average has been between 12 to 15, so we are grateful for that reduction. But I say that with a dose of salt, knowing that I put the caveat in that we are co talking about confirmed cases. These mean that persons have been tested and have been so confirmed. It doesn't mean that that might be the full quantum, but it must mean by extension that we have to keep our efforts going forward as it relates to regular testing and preventative measures to, in terms of arresting the transfer of that illness. Currently, we have 283 persons in the Federation living with HIV. And for the year, we have done 2,851 HIV tests. 2,593 were done in St. Kitts and 258 in Nevis. We are also seeing, based on the latest studies coming out of PAHO, including the report that was presented to our country last Friday at the validation exercise, that there is an upsurge in our Caribbean basin of men who present more with, as new infections for HIV, largely because of their aversion to seek regular medical checkups, etc. 
So in this, in, by, by extension, what the Ministry of Health is going to be doing in 2018 is to place more emphasis on getting our men folk tested. We are also going to be leveraging the work that we have achieved, the gains that we have measured in terms of the Boys Mentorship Program and the National Men's Council, which are already in place so that we can get those testing numbers and the surveillance up to where it should be. There are 14 of such testing sites in the Federation, with 10 in St. Kitts and 4 in Nevis, in terms of the rapid tests that are available. And the only non-rapid testing site for HIV continues to be the JNF laboratory. The oncology unit, we are seeing some 43 patients registered in 2017. I'm still discussing, in, to some extent, the NCD issue, um, with a total of 383 visits. Of that number, 85 patients, in terms of patient visits, that is, would have uh, had intravenous treatment, in other words, chemotherapy-based treatment. 187 were placed on oral treatment or the tablet type of uh, oncology drugs. And of course, there were 133 treatment sessions performed, broken down by the following cancer types. Breast cancer 50, colon cancer 23, renal cancer, which is kidney cancer, and that is at nine. And of course, there's one patient each that we would have seen present for treatment as it relates to pancreatic, renal, prostate, and cervical cancer. The mental health, the treatment center, that is now open to the public. That center would have opened with 11 patients once we would have completed the months of setbacks as a result of staff training, standard operating procedures relative to the operation of the facility, the telecoms infrastructure issue we had with, which called for the laying of an underground cable from that center to connect into JNF, which is the site of the acute mental health facility. And of course, there were some interpersonal staffing issues that the ministry had to take a considerable amount of time to deal with so that we put the best interests of patients at the forefront. Presently, there are now six of such patients who are being cared for on a daily basis at the facility. Two of the individuals dropped out, and three of them are patients at JNF Hospital. But I should note for the benefit of the public that all 11 patients who we have accommodated at the mental health, the treatment center, came as a result of issues contingent to their problems with the consumption of drugs. So it is a matter for which we continue to work with the National <coughs> Council on Drug Abuse Prevention so that we can get more persons into care as we are able and have a more full sum build out of the program in 2018. With your permission, um, Deputy Speaker, I wish to now turn to some of the 2018 projects and initiatives which the Ministry intends to pursue. And they are, one, the continued expansion of the health information system with the support of the Republic of China on Taiwan. Between 2016 and 2017, approximately US $50,000 would have been spent on the procurement of the required computer systems and peripherals to build out that program, which was pegged at a fuller cost of $97,944, which was government's input in terms of recruiting the network specialist and technician. There is to be shortly a handing over ceremony from the Taiwanese to the government of St. Kitts and Nevis, now that most of the available data has been put into the system. And it's an ongoing process so as new persons present themselves for care at the various healthcare facilities, their data will be entered into the system, hopefully once and for all, so that you don't have to keep repeating the same documentation on tests and forms over and over every time you access any of those facilities. Completion of the interconnectivity, that is something which the um, Attorney General's Ministry, IT, is dealing with in conjunction with us. The move of the bill would have also mentioned the construction of the Tabernacle Health Center, for which I want to spend a little bit of time now with your leave. And uh, that project has already started. 
and it comes after a very long and inconvenient past, going back to January of 2014, when the health center had to be placed inside of the daycare center in Tabernacle, more specifically in the basement of the daycare center. It was not the best environment for rendering care. Privacy issues were an one matter. The issue of um, climate conditions inside that facility is another issue because even though some areas were air conditioned, we did have problems. However, the construction has begun already. The project is valued at 2.4 million. Public Works has awarded the contract for the reconstruction to Williams and Sons Construction. And while I'm on that note, with your leave, Deputy Speaker, I wish to point to an accusation that would have been made by the leader of the opposition this morning relative to imputing improper motive as it relates to the arrangements for that bid. And if I can go with your leave to a memo from Mr. Cromwell Williams, the Director of Public Works, dated the 29th of September, Mr. Williams would have been using this memorandum to give a report on the bid process. And of course, in that note, he indicates that there were four companies invited to bid. Only two of them did take up that offer. And the two were a company called Weldon Construction and Williams and Son Construction. The bid opening process um, took place on the 15th of September at 1.16 p.m. And in the presence of the following individuals, and these individuals were Cromwell Williams, Brian Dillon Sergio, George Gilbert, jo um, Jolyn Jarvis, Zizan Claxton, I hope I'm pronouncing that lady's name correctly, Calvin Percival, and William Challenger. The bids were opened at 1.21 p.m. And the two bids from the two individuals were Williams and Son, 2,373,946 and 86 cents, to be done in a period of three calendar um, days, well done construction at a cost of $2,661,218.70 with a build out of over the course of 270 days. The recommendation from Public Works signed by the director, Mr. Williams, was to award the contract to Williams and Sons. It is my understanding that that project will be completed by November of 2018. And with your leave, if I can just indicate that the areas to be covered by that reconstructed facility are the areas from Bellevue to Otley's. Some of the amenities that would go into that facility, modern air conditioned waiting areas, comfortable private and spacious treatment and consultation rooms, adequate storage for medical and environmental health supplies, proper office space for nurse practitioners, nurse in attendance, community nurse manager, the district medical officer, and the environmental health worker, inbuilt infrastructure for water harvesting, solar water heating, etc., ample parking for patients accessing care, including parking for persons with disabilities. Um, based on the exterior elevations that we have seen, the construction of the Tabernacle Health Center now sets a new standard in terms of um, clinic or health center facilities around the island, which I am sure will now be the benchmark going forward. But it is a far cry from what was the dispensation that had to be gotten rid of, which was the fact that the old facility had been had outgrown its usefulness. There was extensive termite damage, a compromised foundation. Also the matter of termite infestation even in the mature fruit trees on the property. And of course, there was also the issue of an imploded septic system. So all of these corrective measures had to be taken on board in terms of ensuring that the people of that area, Bellevue to Otley's, get at least some sort of decent, modern, and appropriate facility where public health interventions can be done on their behalf. Now, the continued restructuring of the Health Information Unit, I should also indicate that this is a work in progress with the support of the ICT infrastructure that the IT department has assisted us with. Also, with the use of uh, 
new um, software that would help us to accelerate and ensure that the data being produced by that unit would be accurate, especially given our international obligations to World Health Organization, PAHO, CAFO, and other international agencies with whom we have relationships, strategic relationships, that is. The addition of our epidemiologist from Cuba has also helped tremendously, and I must call him out for commendations, Dr. Rosales, in terms of the monthly production of statistics as it relates to the health care status of this country, epidemiology type information on disease, etc. It is a far cry from what we are the Ministry of Health was two years ago. So we are very grateful for that. I now move on to one other serious investment that the Ministry will be making in 2018, and it has to do with the investment in a comprehensive security and surveillance infrastructure for JNF Hospital. JNF Hospital, by its design, has many vulnerable points in terms of areas of access onto the property. By extension, in the past, JNF Hospital has witnessed a number of breaches by persons who feel it is their right to come to the hospital and secure vengeance on others who may have done them harm. We have had issues even outside of the surgical theater door where when Dr. Wilkinson is finished patching up an individual, the perpetrator or whoever he had ought to it is waiting at the door to finish him or her off. Then the unthinkable took place in June or July of this year where there was someone who came on the compound, proceeded to the laboratory where another individual was waiting to have a lab test done and then took the life of that individual. Needless to say, the staff of the hospital, persons who use the hospital on an outpatient basis, patients who are, are warded there, naturally will not feel safe. And as a result of that, the ministry and the government took the decision to invest in a comprehensive security system going forward from 2018, which will then see coverage at all points of the hospital 24 hours a day. That um, particular project is costing the government $970,000 to put in place, but it's an investment that we consider to be well worth it because we could not put a price on human life no matter how hard we try. And if persons are in a facility for care and for wellness, they should not be worried about whether or not they will be gunned down in crossfire or to feel threatened or unsafe by having to be in a better cross from someone who, is, who has a known criminal history. And these are some of the very real concerns that we have in front of us. The NCD response mechanism, if I can get to that point. In light of what I would have stated earlier and what the mover of the bill would have noted at length in terms of our challenges with NCDs, the Ministry of Health in 2018 has taken the decision to build out an in-service public health training component within the institution-based health services for the very first time in our history. Our in-service training program is confined to JNF Hospital, and that is mainly for hospital nurses and other medical practitioners. Because we realize that the fight in terms of the reversal of fortunes and outcomes and, and statistics for NCDs resides at the public health level in the community where people actually live. We have made the decision to build out a similar in-service component for public health using Pogson Hospital, um, Pogson Hospital Complex as the base for that. So as of January of 2018, we will be appointing a public health in-service coordinator to manage that new build-out that will complement what is already in place at JNF for the other institution-based workers. And it is hoped that through that project, we can then do the requisite training and retraining where necessary to ensure that our healthcare workers go out into the community and do what is necessary in terms of outreach to persons who have 
been suffering with NCDs or in cases where we wish to prevent those NCDs. And to give you an idea of the curriculum, it will focus on maternal and child health, diabetic treatment and care, hypertensive care, growth monitoring, and I will explain that. Growth monitoring, based on CAFA's definition, has to do with um, the infant clinic in particular, where they have noticed that there are gaps in terms of the measurements that are being done, measurement instruments, and I guess perhaps maybe human um, inexperience, even simple tests like taking a cranial or head measurement, they have found that that had been done inaccurately. And by extension, it might then mean that we might be making wrong decisions or judgment calls in terms of parents who have children who appear to be underweight. And when we go to check to see what is really going on, it's a case where the person who has been taking these vitals does not understand simple things like how to use that scale properly or how to use the measurement instrument properly. And it has repercussions for us even from the standpoint of child probation services because if any of those instances are dramatic enough to get reported to that unit, it then becomes a matter for the court because that child unfortunately and inaccurately will be deemed to be living in a family that is not caring for it and it might mean separation from parent and child. So we have to be very careful in terms of the training that we put in place for those workers in the community-based health services. And of course, we also want to use that platform to do more in terms of the consistent monitoring, screening, and treatment of cancer cases in between visits, in between hospitalization, etc. So that is one major issue we have in terms of our NCD response, so that hopefully in the new year you will see more of a build out in the community, more of a concerted presence in terms of our community-based workers doing what they have to do in terms of trying to reverse the t statistics and improving the health outcome of our people. One of the things that has come home to the Ministry of Health, and by extension the Ministry of Social Services, is the matter to do with the aging population that not just St. Kitts and Nevis is confronted with, but the rest of the CARICOM sub-region and the OECS by extension. And that is now very clear to us in terms of the Cardin Home. The Cardin Home is one of three publicly run facilities in the Federation that focus on senior care. The other two being the Flamboyant Home in Nevis and the Saddler's Home for the Elderly, even though that one comes with a price tag, a modest price tag attached to it. In paragraph 65 of the budget address, the mover of the bill would have addressed in some detail the extension to the Cardin Home that is being envisioned in 2018 to help respond to the overcrowding issue. At present, Cardin Home has something like about 81 residents and really cannot accommodate another person. So the ministry has been able to identify a building in Sandy Point. The building is part of the original assets of SSMC. It is the old terminus building located at the entrance to Farms Estate. And that building is being renovated within the first 90 days of 2018 to accommodate 10 extra persons in that facility, which will f um, function as an extension to the Cardin home. And it is envisioned that those persons who will be placed in that facility would be persons who live closer to that district so that they can be closer to their families as well. And of course, that facility is expected to serve the elderly between the area of Deep Bay to Old Road to help alleviate that type of problem that we are seeing at the Cardin Home at the moment. In order to outfit that facility properly, there have been 19 new positions that have been approved for 2018 to the tune of some $372,000. They include four orderlies, three registered nurses, three nursing um, assistants, four domestic workers, and three nursing attendants. There's a difference between the two. So that will be the outfit of that particular unit by April of next year, once the renovations and expansion to that facility would have been completed. The strategic plan for the Ministry of Health that would be um, unveiled in early 2018 
built up on 12 pillars. These have been outlined in the minister's message of the 2018 budget um, booklet, but I, with your leave, can mention them quickly. Chronic non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, family health, mental health and substance abuse, health policy and legislation, human resources, health information, medicines and supplies, health financing, research, disaster coordination and health emergency preparation, and persons in this parliament may recall that last year for the first time, we had a budgetary allocation to that in the tune of $15,000 to at least start that new process. And of course, the last one being expanding partnerships for health. Finally, in 2018, we will begin the de demolition of the back of the Jane France General Hospital and begin the process towards the construction of the phase three, which includes all of the back office um, services for that facility, including central medical stores, a new psychiatric wing, administrative offices, housekeeping, kitchen, etc. We would also expect to have in 2018 some enactment of new legislation for health, as well as revisions to existing ones, including but not limited to the Medical Act, the Public Health Act, and the, um, the Lunacy Act of 1956. We are also ensuring that in 2018, a critical amendment to the Medical Act would be that of the annual registration of doctors and other medical practitioners. This is a trend that we want to move to. It's an international trend. We also consider it to be a sign of equity in the system, given that based on the Nurses and Midwives Council Act, nurses, nurse practitioners, nurse in attendance, you name it, all have to be registered on an annual basis with proof that they have entered into career development hours to justify that they are remaining current with the trends and skill sets that are required in their industry. So by extension, we will be putting in place a similar arrangement for medical doctors, chiropodists, pharmacists, etc., who are all covered extensively under the Medical Act. And of course, this means that it should provide an added measure of comfort to the citizens of this country in knowing that the doctor that you're going to is staying current with his or her craft in terms of the technology, equipment that they're using, medications being prescribed, and medical interventions going forward so that we can generally say that we are benchmarking properly with the rest of the world. I would like to just mention one more issue, and that has to do with the matter of, in terms of capital projects still, the matter to do with the continuous health sector improvement project for our 11 health centers around St. Kitts. And of course, in tandem with the build out of a more concentrated effort towards confronting NCDs, that will be happening on a staggered basis throughout the length and breadth of the Federation in terms of those health centers. I also wish, in closing off this section of my report, on health to mention, as did the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs and member for number nine said earlier, that the Ministry of Health is current with all of its quota obligations to international agencies, such as PAHO, the WHO, and CAFO. And in addition to those, we continue with the annual subvention to the Solid Waste Management Corporation. And by that I mean that on a monthly basis, solid waste gets from the Ministry of Health a subvention of $125,000 to assist them in meeting their budgetary and operational requirements. I now move, with your leave, Deputy Speaker, to a report focusing on the Ministry of Social Services, Community Development and Gender Affairs, which this year has seen a dramatic increase in its budgetary allocation by 123.7%, meaning that the total is now $18,237,045. Of course, this represents an increase of some $9.5 million over 2017, and I will explain in further detail where we are going with this dramatic change. The Ministry of Social Services, etc., continues to be a ministry in transition. 
we continue to do proper restructuring and paying attention to critical areas of that ministry, especially the child probation department, gender affairs, and the administration of social services and community development initiatives. As a result of that, certain staff reassignments have been put in place out of necessity. Certain um, changes would have been made in terms of nomenclature within the budget volume two, I think it is. We are, even though we have not technically added a lot of staff to that unit, to that ministry, the titular roles and the functions have been altered for improved efficiency within that area. But one of the issues I must state categorically from the outset is that everything that we do in the Ministry of Social Services, Community Development and Gender Affairs is done with the people of St. Kitts and Nevis in mind. And it is for that reason, when it comes to the restructuring of that ministry, we have taken on board serious criticism, serious observations that we have seen ourselves in terms of ensuring that we have the right personalities in the jobs where people need help the most. Yes, the ministry has been unfairly attacked in the press, and even this morning, concerning what is perceived as people being turned away for care. I am not aware of any such thing happening under my watch where I would have given an instruction for. However, Madam Deputy Speaker, what I will tell you is that the adjustments that we have made in certain areas to staffing is in response to that matter just now. Because we do not consider, one, that persons can do social services from behind a desk. You have to go out and understand how people are living before you make your decision as to what care they're entitled to get. So it is for that reason why some of that restructuring would have been taking place in that regard. We are also seeing, in terms of the ministry, continued positive trends in terms of longevity. We are seeing people living well beyond the expected age of 70 or 71. And for the first time, we have been seeing over the last couple of years a situation where at any given point we actually had, in one instance, up to 18 centenarians. And that is a remarkable achievement for the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. And of course, the oldest of such individual is Miss Cillian Powell at the Flamboyant Home in Nevis, who this year turned 105. However, with that aging population, it means that we have to ensure that they continue to live decent, meaningful lives where they are properly cared for and their human dignity is maintained. And that, of course, is part and parcel of the reason for the investment in the Cardin Homes extension so that we could meet some of these challenges. As I say this, I'm reminded of Paho's statement in their recently published report on aging and demographic changes that would have been issued at the most recent sitting of COSAD in September of this year, that while investment through the life course is imperative, the reality is that the Latin, Latin America and the Caribbean will have to adapt much more quickly to the growth of the aging population at a much lower levels of national income compared to the experience of higher income countries in North America. The report continues by saying that the aging population would experience greater functional loss, dependence, and demand for care. And despite the visible implications that this phenomenon will have for social security and public health in the next 10 years, the region still lacks a plan for long-term care. Well, the Ministry of Health social services, etc., is not waiting for that regional plan because it is our intention to roll out a national policy on aging in 2018 using, of course, benchmarking and best practices that are available to us globally from which we can draw the best for our people. The ministry is carrying out its work in terms of social services outreach to the elderly via the um, assignment of some 18 home care officers. I note in the estimates that an additional three such positions have been provided to us, bearing in mind the increasing demand for home care officers throughout the five zones of St. Kitts and Nevis. And of course, I will explain what these five zones are shortly, but the training that they have been exposed to is just the same as the training that would be provided to nursing attendants at JNF Hospital. As a matter of fact, every batch 
of EMT officers and nursing attendants that are turned out after graduation at JNF includes at least some persons who are being trained as home care officers because the curriculum is identical so that we can make sure that they make sure that there's consistency in the high standard of care that these elderly persons would receive and while I'm on that note I would wish to document the ministry's continued gratitude for the leadership shown by Miss Ann Wigley in terms of leading that elder care program by extension the ministry also commends the supportive relationship that we have had with her counterpart in Nevis, Mrs. Garcia Hendrickson, who is now retired. And we have to indicate that this year, as well as the last two years, we have seen actual positive demonstrative partnership in the way these two ministries across the Narrows have be been able to work together to achieve the goals of a senior care in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. The ministry continues to manage the New Horizons Rehabilitation Center in Harris's village. At present, there are some six residents at the center. One was recently discharged into the care of her parents, and that facility now has the benefit of standard operating procedures which were never put in place, but now are as a result of a grant and intervention by UNICEF between last year and this year, and of course, the other areas that are being dealt with include cross-sectoral stakeholder training in terms of child probation and the juvenile justice sector. And a UK consultant was able to assist us in this particular matter. The ministry continues to function as the intermediary of persons with disability in St. Kitts and Nevis. We continue to provide rent-free accommodation to that um, association of persons living with disability at the McKnight Community Center. We have also gone a step further in terms of a monthly subvention of $2,500 to cover the cost of a driver for a newly acquired bus that has been provided to persons with disability by the SIDF to the tune of $250,000. In a show of good faith, the Cabinet has, since April of 2016, also approved the ratification of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That convention would have been adopted by the UN since 2006, and St. Kitts and Nevis has now signaled its assent to that convention and would be expected to provide all of the build-outs that are set down in terms of that convention when it comes to persons with special needs. In addition to that support, the ministry is also partnering with Ade's Place at Greenlands in terms of the rent that is paid for that facility to the tune of $13.50 a month. At present, there are now 17 trainees who are attached to the program, and these are persons who are receiving um, small allowances, stipends from the STEP program in terms of assisting them with basic out-of-pocket ex expenses as they are exposed to new skills in terms of craft making, etc. And they would have recently held an observance for International Day of Persons with Disability, which was on Sunday. And I would have had the pleasure of participating in a subsequent exercise with that group where I consider serious work is being done to assist children with those types of disabilities because they are special persons who require special care. There are 20 children presently in foster care in St. Kitts and Nevis. 11 of them are females, 9 are males. These children live in 21 different foster homes, and in addition to this number, we do have some children who are living with family members in what we consider a kinship care arrangement. In that arrangement, there are seven female children and one male. And of course, the adoptive parents are being supervised by the Child Welfare and Probation Department to ensure that they are not being abused, that the children are well adjusted, and that they're in good health. Support for the year for the foster care program is some 95,191. 
In addition to these children who are in foster care, the government has a subvention, an annual subvention to the St. Christopher Children's Home, which is a privately run facility, to the tune of 10,000 per quarter, in addition to support with medication, eyeglasses, school uniforms, etc. And this year, with the addition of the hurricane preparatory measures that would have been put in place there, purchasing of food for the hurricane period, mattresses, etc., and electrical repairs that would have been necessary as a result of a post-hurricane Irma electrical fault that was started in the world in conduits at that facility. So far for this year, government has invested 54,810 in that particular facility. In terms of the food voucher program, we do have quite a number of individuals who are benefiting from these food vouchers. Some 230 households at least are benefiting. And of course, well over uh, two, about approximately 200,000 would have been spent thus far on some of these applicants for other things like medical expenses and so forth, overseas medical care that would have been warranted and so forth and assistance with surgery. Gender Affairs, this ministry continues to work closely with the Special Victims Unit to conduct outreach, support, and legal advocacy to the victims of domestic violence. The department continues to manage Project Viola, which is a teen mother's program that allows pregnant teens to return to school and complete their education. Victims of domestic violence, if I can share some of the statistics that we have in front of us, are both male and female. Of course, with the majority of them being females. Data up to November 2017 reflect that some 262 cases have been reported by female victims, while 38 have been reported by male victims for a total of 301 instances of domestic violence. Such violence is characterized as sexual in nature, verbal, or physical, or combination of all of those. Women under the age of 30 are the predominant female victims of violence. There have been 147 such cases for the year already, while the men over age 30 reflect most instances of abuse among men. There have been 28 such male victims, with most of these cases being reported as physical abuse, and we are noting that for 2017, only one reported case of rape has been documented. I say one reported case again because this does not mean that there has only been one. It means that only one has been reported. By extension, the hospital has been working with Gender Affairs and the Special Victims Unit in terms of looking at these issues of domestic violence and the types of medical interventions that are warranted. And for example, the hospital records from January to October would reflect that some 20 victims of domestic violence would have received treatment at the facility during that period. In 10 of the instances, the perpetrators were reported as being either the victim's boyfriend or father. The hospital has recorded four instances of domestic abuse perpetrated by girlfriends of the victims. And JNF has also recorded that the months with the highest number of domestic violence treatments were February with five cases and June with seven cases. So I don't know what would make that type of month, those two months so special in terms of leading up, or if it's just coincidental. There have been persons positing whether or not the impact of the music festival, Minister for Number Four and inebriation might be contributing to those things, or as it relates to the case of February, whether it's not a situation of relationships gone bad. We will not wish to posit any suggestion as to why those rates are the way they are. In terms of the Department of Community Development, we are changing the structure as it relates to the use of these facilities. We have 16 community centers in St. Kitts, and about three of them are not fully operational. The one in Lodge is subject to reconstruction. The one in Parsons is not really operational. And the one in St. Peter's is currently undergoing some 
well needed repairs, so those three definitely are off limits. However, as part of our better build out and achieving the people-centered approach to development that we want to see, a decision has been taken to decentralize the activities of the community development portion of the ministry by putting satellite offices in most, if not all, of these community centers so that we bring government services closer to the persons for whom they are intended. And by extension, we will be putting probation officers there with the support of the legal department and, of course, with their oversight as well to ensure that that matter is dealt with in a more accommodating manner for the persons who require such services. The ministry still manages the counseling unit at Greenlands, which performs critical outreach to persons in crisis. The staff continues to be limited and stretched. However, this coming year, the ministry, will, at that department rather, will be partnering with um, a USAID-sponsored project in terms of uh, doing family counseling. And uh, it is hoped that once this project has been, well, at least we've signed on for one year so far, when that year is over, then we will see what the future holds for it, and hopefully we may be able to recruit some of the persons who would have been trained as family counselors to complement the understaffing issue that currently exists. Some of the challenges that we continue to have relative to the administration of the ministry's mandate include the near retirement age of most of our home care officers. I indicated that this year's estimates would have approved three additional officers, and that is well needed. There is an increasing demand for such services. We are serving something like between 120, sometimes up to maybe 200 of so, such clients, because sometimes the needs are not consistent. They might be one-off. Um, the matter to do with the ratification of the domestic violence um, protocol, that has been delayed a bit. However, the legal department is working <coughs> with us to put in place some new spatial provisions in that policy in order to handle in a dignified and safe manner the issues relating to victims of domestic violence, especially rape cases with sensitive material, with the support of the magistrate's court insofar as the layout of that facility would be concerned. We are also noticing that um, there is an increasing demand on the Ministry for Public Assistance, and uh, not limited to medical assistance, each um, request to the ministry comes with an initial cap of 5,500 US dollars. Anything over that requires cabinet approval. Based on the data that we have seen so far for 2017, in terms of disease burden by zones, and I indicated earlier I would say what these zones are. Zone 1, East Bastia, St. Peter's and Connery. Zone 2, Central Bastia and Palmetto Point. Zone 3, Challengers to Sandy Point. Zone 4, Newton Ground to Tabernacle. And Zone 5, Mansion to Canada. What we are noticing is that based, the smallest allocation for medical assistance has been seen in Zone 4. Newton going to Tabernacle, and that is pricing at 28187 That doesn't mean that that zone has less instances of illness. It just means that less persons from that zone would have access care or assistance from the ministry. The zone that has the greatest allocation is Zone 1, East Bastia, St. Peter's, and Connery, in the amount of 53563 and out of that total of applicants, there were five applications made for assistance with cancer treatment, especially radiation therapy, which is not yet available in St. Kitts. That basically gives an, um, a, a picture in terms of what we are dealing with relative to the build out of the social assistance program. However, as I noted earlier, we do realize that there are gaps in that system which we would wish to improve, such as the voucher system that is in place at the moment. Vouchers are only made available for food purchase to um, uh, eligible um, clients once every six weeks. And we consider this to not be satisfactory, especially when you take into account the amount of the voucher and the cost of food and the number of persons that might be living in a particular household. So that, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, is the reason why the Ministry of 
social services, etc., would have seen that dramatic increase in terms of the budgetary allocation for social services to the tune of $9.5 million. It is a project that is being done rather systematically with this Ministry of Sustainable Development, Ministry of Finance, the Caribbean Development Bank, especially as it relates to the actual execution of the new country poverty assessment exercise that has just been launched, and also with support from social security and of course um, bolstered with the data that we have already inputted into the national household registry that is also housed within the ministry and the intention is to make sure that there's a proper poverty survey that can inform where care where assistance is needed most along four tiers of need and these four tiers would have been classified as follows Level one, which is at a destitute level. Level two, considered poor or needy. Level three, vulnerable, but not necessarily poor or needy. And level four, that was level three, so in level four, is the non-vulnerable, which are the non-poor, who can fend for themselves. The goal of the ministry is to focus on people who cannot fend for themselves, or persons who need assistance, having to have ends meet, etc. As a result of this project that we are now engaged in, we have had cause to critically assess the MEND program that had been put in place several years ago. And of course, we had to come to the very honest and sober conclusion that that particular project did not necessarily meet the needs of enough individuals. That project would have been capitalized to the tune of well over $800,000. And as of last year, only 42 families were in that particular program, which is by our standards is insufficient to say the least. It is hoped that by the time the revamping of the social services program is completed, which should happen no later than mid-year next year, then we will see the real purpose of that particular topping up of the budgetary allocation, because it then means that there will be a synchronized, a more synchronized approach to the administration of social services interventions, the voucher program, as we know it will be revamped, and it is the intention of the government by that point to then replace all of these little bits and pieces of assistance. Does not mean that we are going to not render medical care anymore, that is something that will remain separate and distinct, but it is the intention of this government to ensure that by mid-year next year, we will be in a position to deliver on a campaign commitment of ensuring that households earning less than $3,000 a month in combined income will be given assistance to the tune of $500 per month. And uh, yeah, yeah. This this so that is the intention of that budgetary allocation. Yeah, but and uh, it is something that we wish that we will get the support even of the opposition on in terms of your own communities where there are persons who are in crisis. We are also drawing from the support of NGO groups and the churches to assist us in that regard as well because they also collect their own data and have their own outreach as it relates to the poor and indigent. For example, the St. Vincent de Paul Society or Women's League Movement within the Catholic Church and a number of other programs that are done by other churches throughout the island to make sure that we have a more harmonized system of care and outreach to persons so that the social safety nets that should be in place are there and that nobody is left behind or falls through the cracks. Mm -hmm. So that is the explanation in a nutshell yeah. of the $9.5 million increase relative to the build out of the social services outreach to persons who are considered indigent, poor or vulnerable. Of course, the program will be designed to help people out of poverty, because what we do not want is for people to remain in that situation, but at least they must be helped along the way until they can manage on their own. Before I wrap up, I just needed to mention um, one or two other issues, and it has to do with the matter with persons who are in crisis. and. Uh, Basically, it is to state that the doors of the Ministry of Social Services are open to persons who require help. 
We will require support from the community in terms of assisting us to identify those individuals who they know to be in crisis, persons whose living conditions are well below the levels that they should be, so that we can get care to them and get support to them, so that we maintain their dignity as a human person. The Boys Mentorship Program, which you'll leave, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm happy to report that this program is turning out to be quite a success from the pilot that it was two years ago. This program started at the Charles E. Mills Secondary School several years ago under this government. There were a total of 11 boys identified as at risk in the program, and those individuals would have been placed under the care of mentors who the Office of the Attorney General was fortunate enough to get us some support with training through the OECS Juvenile Justice Reform Project so that they can assist these young men. And uh, just this past couple of weeks, I think when we celebrated the 25 Remarkable Teens, one of those individuals was a graduate out of that boys mentorship program and it was a proud moment for our ministry because that young man is now somebody who is at the Clarence Fitzroy Bryant College now that he has had a second chance and an opportunity to turn his life around and it's those types of success stories we want as um, diversion programs so that we put more meaningful systems and role models in the lives of these young men who would otherwise resort to a situation of gang membership or recruitment, or perhaps adopting other forms of antisocial behavior. Now to come back to the counseling unit at Greenlands, I indicated earlier that there's a USAID project that should take off shortly. That project is in tandem with a consultant by the name of Creative Associates, a USAID contractor, and of course, USAID will be funding 75% of this, with the other 25% coming from the ministry. The National Household Registry Program, as I indicated earlier, will continue a build out in terms of a linkage and referral component, so that more scientific and systematic decision making is made, insofar as the rendering of essential services to our people would be concerned including but not limited to housing, education, et cetera, and the very same social assistance program that we have revamped for next year. However, for that to work properly, we will also have to see to it that the social protection bill is passed in parliament, which sets out the modalities as to how that household registry program is supposed to operate. We would expect to complete the ratification of that same UN Convention on the Rights with Persons with Disability. And we would also, by extension, be continuing our obligations under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which this country would have ratified since 1990. In closing, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I wish to document my full support for this budget that has been presented to us. Insofar as the areas for which I have responsibility are concerned, I can truly say that it is a people-centered approach to development, and it is a process that the ministry is privileged to assist with in terms of bettering the lives of our people here in St. Kitts and Nevis, not just for today or tomorrow, but for the sustainable future in keeping with the goals enshrined in the sustainable development goals to which all member states are signatory. On that note, Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, I render my full support to this bill. May it please you.